every day you're on that stage, you got to leave a piece of yourself there. You must make the sacrifice. You must leave that precious part of yourself there because you got to pull that out of you to help form this incredible idol, this you're building an idol, something for people to look at and revere. And you cannot build it without substance. And the substance is inside of you if you follow where I'm coming from. So you got to give this precious thing up because you got to contribute it to the idol. When I say the idol, it's, 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 it's what you're going to sacrifice. The idols are what people tear down and pull down and burn up and bury and steal. So that's what you building, something that's very sacred. You cannot build something sacred without sacred material. So you need to bring me your heart. That's as sacred as you can get. If you don't bring me your heart, I'm going to keep on messing with you. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Ruben Santiago Hudson is an actor. He sat down with me on the Upper West Side of Manhattan to talk about the work. When you first get a script, what is the first step you take in preparation to play that character? Well, you know, when, when I get a script, I'm usually looking at it from perspective, whether it's the, the acting or directing perspective, I'm looking at it as, is it a story I want to be a part of and tell? It's the first thing I look at. Does this excite me and why? Why do I want to tell this story? Who do I want to tell it to? You know, uh, why it's important. And if, that, if it's that, it just can't be entertainment. You know, it's just got to excite me on, on far more than just an entertainment value. It's got to matter. So once I see that, once the script matters to me, the story matters to me, then I start uh, uh, trying to figure out if I'm the director, how to tell the story. Uh, if I'm the actor, I'm thinking of, OK, how does my character fit into the story? How does it progress? This make, how does he make the story move forward? Where does he fit in? What is his part? Why? You know, and then I break it down a different way as an actor. I got to make sure that I'm serving the play, serving the 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 film that the, that the writer wrote. And usually if it's a film or TV, one of my biggest tasks is to make them human. Because as an actor of color, it's always uh, uh, the attitude they're looking for more than the humanity. So uh, in theater, it's, it's usually not hard to grasp the humanity of my characters. Because in theater, it's usually if I'm doing a play, it's usually written by a person of color. So they see me more as a human being than a TV or film person who's not my color usually they, they're writing oh then the black guy comes in oh then the police chief comes in oh then the prisoner comes in oh then the street rough guy comes in oh then the cab driver comes in they, they look at an attitude or a part of life whereas in theater you are life you got to create a whole life for the character so you know depending on what i'm approaching it takes different different uh, uh tasks to get it done to its fullest we, we're trying to 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 organize an event put together an event in the highest form of integrity, artistic integrity, uh, human integrity, uh, entertainment value integrity. We're trying to put together uh, this event. We, you know, the director is throwing this huge party. He's bringing the food, he's bringing the music, he's bringing all the guests, the dancers, but the party's not for him. So how do you orchestrate this party and in, in, in all the while selfishly say, this is my party, this is my party, but it's not. Mm. You know, it's not so... And do you, do you think about who the party is for? Like, for, like for, for those people that you tapped on the shoulder and say, I don't know what you're doing tonight at eight o'clock. Yeah. But the most important thing you're going to hear today, this day, yes. is going to be at, at this theater tonight at eight o'clock. Nothing you hear today is more important. That's what I'm throwing the party and is, for. And is it important that they that they are happy after the party's over? No, I'm, I don't have to make you happy. <laughs> I'm, not trying their to, party. I'm not trying to make you happy. <laughs> no, but, you know, you, you, you go to an event. Many events, and in, in whether you whether you want to put it this way or not, uh, a, a, f a funeral is a party, mm -hmm. a memorial is a party. You might not always be happy at the memorial, but you know it's necessary. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm not looking to make you happy. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to let you, let you have an experience. Mm -hmm. You know, have you had an experience that now you just can't just walk away and start talking about how the Knicks didn't get who they wanted in the trade? No, you have to talk about this situation, this event that you just... Somehow or another, you got to talk about it. I mean, people have written me letters said, I can't sleep. I can't sleep until I, I, I hash this out. And I have left performances saying, I got to talk about this. Whether it was that great or that bad mm -hmm. or that confusing or that, why? 
Mm-hmm. So I want to be able to talk about it. And if you've made me have incited, if you have incited my mind turning and the conversation in my heart and soul and moving a different way, then you've accomplished something. Mm-hmm. There's different ways to talk about all of this because you're not just an actor. You're a director, a very good director, and a writer, of course. So all of these questions, I feel like I want to ask you two sides of the question because I'm sure you've learned so much from directing that as you've entered into your acting again and and vice versa. But when you have to get to a certain place emotionally, do you have steps that are tried and true either from your training or that you've learned that you that now have now imparted to actors when you're directing that that you can just talk to me about a little bit no don't don't give me fake emotion if there's going to be emotion it's going to be there you don't have to plan it you don't have to figure out how to get to it get on you get in you get in the vehicle that you that you're going to just going to move you where you need to go emotionally mm-hmm. get inside of it Invest in it. And if it's supposed to be emotion, it's going to be emotion. I never ask for tears. I'm never looking for tears. I don't like to cry. Mm-hmm. I do cry sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it's because, if I cry, it's because I couldn't help it. And that's what I demand from my actors. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see tears because you want tears. I don't want the effect of tears. Tears are the effect of something else. Right. A lot of people give you tears so they can get elicit, elicit a reaction from you. Tears are a reaction that's been elicited from something else internal from you, an experience a thought, a feeling. Uh, uh, uh. So no, I, you know, I, I'm a true believer of if you invest the way you should invest in the writing as good as it should be, wherever you're supposed to be, uh, whether it's supposed to be funny, it will be funny. If it's supposed to be sad, it'll be sad. Uh, th- they're all the results of, of things. I don't like results. I don't like to reach for the results. I like to, to achieve the result. But not, you're not reaching for it. This is my goal. At the, you know, if, if you're looking at the script and it says, okay, in the end, you know, I go to my, my best friend's funeral. So you reaching all the way for that already. Well, what happened before that, before the funeral? You were friends. Yeah. You had times together, good and bad times. You had moments together, glories and defeats. Yeah. And then it, when, when that is no longer, it could never be again. That voice you'll never hear again. Those are all the realities you got to you gotta process yeah. and see what that brings out of you. Yeah. That'll bring the emotion that you need if you have invested in the other things. First, the friendship, the joys, the laughter, the defeats and victories with a human being. Then you don't have to reach. Then all of a sudden, that's no more. Do Do you bring your actors through the backstory, defeats and glories? improvisationally or whatever in the process no. of working. No, 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 no. I want them to do their job. I'm not going to do their job. <laughs> they're not doing their job. I'm going to continue to ask questions to to clearly point out that they're not doing their job. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to say you need to da da da. No, I'm from the Lloyd Richard School of Directing. So I'm going to ask you questions. It's going to be clear to you that you don't know the answer or you do know the answer. And if you don't know the answer, I'll say you need to know that. Mm-hmm. So a- asking questions. It's, so it's not telling you what to do. Mm-hmm. It, the, the questions uh, elicit the actor to have to come up with the answers. And then that's a process that begins a process of something coming out of them. Yes, yeah, so right? sometimes I don't let you answer. Most of the time I don't let you answer the question. I'm not asking for answers. I'm asking you to think about this. You know, if something like, for instance, like, like for, say for instance, I don't see the depth in the relationship between two lovers. I may ask, how long have you guys been together? And, and you may answer uh, or not. And I said, think about how long you've been together how much this means to both of you. Look at that individual and I want you to know how much that person means to you. Let's do the scene again. And I let him process it for a little while and then it changes the the, the level of uh, intent and level of relationship and closeness Mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, then I'll ask you another question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, Like if an actor comes into a, say for instance, just hypothetically speaking, say an actor walks into the house of, a, of, an, of another character on play on, on stage and it just they say they're too familiar. And I won't say you're too familiar with this apartment. After the scene, I might say when I'm giving notes, I'm going to say, how many times have you come to this apartment? And the actor may say, it's the first time I came in. OK, all right. Is that behavior appropriate? Question, another question. Yeah. Is the behavior that you just showed me appropriate for a person that's been there once? 
or been there 10 times. Like the person might come in and don't know where to sit. And in the play, it says, you know, you come over every Friday. Mm-hmm. So that's some kind of neuroses if they don't know where to sit. Mm-hmm. Usually if a person comes to your house every Friday, they probably go to the same seat, same seat. whether it's the kitchen table or the, or the chair in the living room. Or no, you can't sit in the chair in the living room. So you, the questions are for this purpose, to take inappropriate choices and replace them with appropriate choices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what the questions are for. Now, let me ask you, and this might be a stupid question. Do you as director have to know the correct answers to all of those questions? And 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 let me just also say this. If you ask me that question, how many times do you come over here? And I either I give you the answer or I have it in my my own mind. Oh, okay, thank you. I know how many. But it's it's literally not the correct one because my behavior is going to be different than what it should be if because you know what the writer wanted in that moment. You, do, you know what I mean? Like, so how do you, like, does the director have to know the answer to all of these questions? And how do you get the actor to come up with the right answer if they don't have the right answer? Because you keep, right you answers, keep, you, right? you got to find out how to be effective and get them to, to make the right choice. Your choice as a director is the choice that you know works for the vehicle, for the play. Right. Now, you might see something else from the actor that also works for the play that also is appropriate. (laughs) So there's no one definitive answer to everything. There are certain answers that are the definitive answer. This is an appropriate reaction to what you just, or else something is not normal. Like if somebody takes a hot poker and sticks it to your back, there is an appropriate reaction. If you have no reaction, that's a different, that's a whole different story you're telling. Yes, right. That's a whole different story you're telling. Right. This person just got a hot poker stuck to their back. They didn't flinch. Yeah. And That's might, a story right there. Right. And it might be it might be a true thing because of some for some reason. And and, and that might actually be a good and reason. Then you'll find yeah. out in the story. Yeah. This person decided, yeah. you know, after the fourth time he was branded, that he would never show emotion again. Yeah. So he suppresses everything. And then somewhere it'll it'll let out. You know what I'm saying? We don't know. Yeah. But it's it for the story that we're telling. The responses have to be the appropriate responses yeah. for the roadmap that's laid out. Yeah. If, if, if the roadmap says if you go straight down, you go, if you go west from when you walk out of this building, you're going to get to Western Avenue. If I tell you that, Peter, you're going to go, you make a left and the next block is West End. And you repeat it and say, yeah, I'm make a left turn in West End because I'm going right there to West End. OK, but if you come out of the building and make a right and then go north Something um, you're telling me a different story. Yeah, you're telling me either you're not going to do it the way I want it, yeah, or you didn't understand what I'm saying. That's right. you, now you're telling a whole different story. Yeah, 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 yeah. I might eventually get to West End. Yeah, yeah, but you, but you, but <laughs> yeah. it's a reason you didn't do exactly what you asked me for. Mm-hmm. It's usually a reason mm-hmm. because there's a dog down there. Later on in the play, I find out it was a bulldog down there that bit me when I was seven, and when I saw that brownstone, I knew I couldn't go past it again because of the trauma. I don't know. We're adding something different to the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like like I had a character one time, and 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 they said to me, "Well, you know, is it possible that I that that my character is gay?" And I said, "Anything is possible, but where does this does the story that we're telling this play support that? Mm-hmm. Is there any other indication in the play that supports that? If you find that, and this is valid, then." It's, it's, it's open for discussion. It's open to, to, to try it. If there's no support for that, just a whim that you have, then why are we doing it? Put that in your nightclub act. Don't put it in this play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got to fit the story we're telling. What happens when actors come to work with you that are established, but they have this way of working it's fine they, they've become successful but they they're not getting deep they don't go deep and they have their habits has this ever happened yes how, how do you what do you do to work with those kind of people to get that out of them to get them back well, to i have to stop and there's no one way i have to stop and figure out well, how, how, you know how can i be effective with that person to get them everybody some people like a strong hand some people like a softer hand some people like <clears throat> sometime i'll give you an article or a documentary to look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I might say, 
I might point to something and say that that, you know, uh, pay attention to that. That's real interesting. That's very similar to you, to your character in a lot of ways. Oh, do you see any similarities? You know, um, you have to find out everybody has their own way of working. And as a good director has to find out how to be effective with each person and, and help them in their process, not change their process, but to evolve their process and make it work for the event. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've had very difficult actors in my room that just did not want, did not like my style of directing, wanted to buck that system, uh, uh, wanted to do things their way. If I say everybody come together, we're going to stand around in this circle. We're going to hold hands. I want us to just be with each other for a minute. Close your eyes. Let's just breathe a little bit, taking the same air. I just want to just exist with you guys for a minute. Let's just take a minute or two of silence. And then the, the actor could be able to talk. Brr, brr. I let him go th through that. Yeah. I've had that. Yeah go through that and then finally they'll calm down. Yeah. And once they calm down, if you see they continue to buck the system, then I would have a conversation with them, a private conversation, mm -hmm. not in front of people. Yeah. And just say, you know, talk to me about why why this doesn't you did you seem to you feel uncomfortable with the with the way I'm doing it. Tell me what what I'm doing that makes you uncomfortable and, and how we can adjust it, make it work for all of us. Yeah. And then they'll tell me and if, if it's a belligerent answer like, I don't, I don't like working that way and I'm not going to work that way. And then I got to figure out how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I got to figure out, do I have the right person in the room mm -hmm. or can I find a way for us to coexist? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have a person on a completely different page. I say everybody come around in a circle and they sit in the corner and don't come. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, you know, it pushes me to the point. I say, if you're going to be in this family, well, you know, when I say family's coming to sit down for dinner, we sit down for dinner. Mm -hmm. That's the way this works. You know, because listen, there's a lot of voices in the room. There's a lot of opinions in, in all my rooms I direct. And everybody has some ownership because, you know, and with that ownership comes responsibility. So, but there's one person that's going to make the final decision, mm -hmm. not a unilateral decision by no means. It's an informed decision by everybody in the room, but I will make the final decision if I'm the director. Mm -hmm. And my lighting designer, costume designer, every actor in that room has some ownership in that decision. But I will make the final decision and, and, and we have to trust it. And so I have to earn that. That's my job. Earn that trust from you. And everyone wants that. Right. They want a strong leader. They want to know that you are the final voice. It, it, they feel safe in that. It's not a it's not an oppression. We hope so. I mean, I had one young actor tell me I was trying to talk to him about things that he was not doing doing uh that he should be doing in his position of responsibility as the lead actor in his play and he said to me you know i've been a lead actor before and so i you know i know what i'm doing and you know i was patient with him to a certain extent i said you know what he needs he needs to, he needs to see the kind of bulldog i am so i came out and said to him listen man i'm giving you the opportunity to be a lead actor in an off-broadway play in the city of new york you have been a lead actor in cincinnati and in minneapolis and in denver and in Baltimore, but not in New York and not with Ruben Santiago Hudson directing you. Now, I have been where you are, in front of you, behind you, on the side of you, and I've taught 200 kids just like you. Now, if you want to accept what I want to give you, this is your room and I'm going to be here for you. If you don't want to accept it, this is your opportunity this day, tonight, to think about it. And tomorrow, let me know if you want to be a part of this. He needed to hear that. Yeah. And he came back. Came back crying, <laughs> hugging me. And to this day, he has not stopped working because I put him in that role mm. that has broken him totally out. He's got two TV series, a movie, of a TV series, two movies. Mm. And he all he does is, coach, thank you, man. Thank you so much, man. Wow. Thank you so much. So so the foresight to know he needed that. Because because it, you, you could have made, it, it could have been the wrong choice, right? It, it could have broken him. He, no, I wouldn't break him. His ego was too strong, but, but he, he could have put him out of that. my room and I would have put somebody else in that spot. Right. There's a line waiting to get in that spot. Right. You know, how did you know that would work, though? That, that's what I wrote. Really because, you know, that, he, he's who I was. Mm. He's who I was when I was that age. You know, a very, very talented actor who had it, the world on the string and knew that he was advanced and, you know, very, very talented. And people wanted to smooch my cheeks because they needed me in the room. But then when I ran into that director that said, you know, I'm going to move forward without you. I want you because you, you're, you're incredible, but you got to come on board. This train is running on this track and I need everybody on it. You can't make your own track now. Find your way on this track. Can you do that? 
You know, so you got to figure out what, what's at stake. Yeah. You know, and then, um, you know, he, he just he just needed it. He really needed it. You know, the things that he would tell me, how we were similar, you know, how he was a bad boy like I was coming up and was in trouble all the time and, you know, uh, was fighting all the time doing things. I was pretty rough coming up like that. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was very similar to me. So he needed that. He didn't have a strong, his father had passed when he was young and he'd been out on his own being a wild child. So he needed that strong male figure. Yeah. He needed to, I don't give yeah. a F guy in front of yeah. him. I don't give a F. Yeah. I don't care if I got to put on a, a shave up and put some makeup on and be the, play the role myself. Yeah. It's going to get done. Yeah. I'm not going to let you stop this train and disrupt this process. I want you to talk about the Negro Ensemble Company and how much that meant to you and your growth. Well, you know, when, when I came to New York, there were only a few places that you had to be if you come into New York and you were black. And, uh, you know, either New Federal, the Negro Ensemble Company, and on a, a lesser extent to a certain degree, you know, National Black Theater and, um, you know, Bob Macbeth's company up in Harlem, but they, they didn't match the NEC, you know, at that, that time. So I came seeking it. You know, I came mm. trying to get a job there. And as Ruben Santiago, they didn't they weren't very open to the name Santiago, you know, in the Negro Ensemble Company. So I added Hudson, my mother's uh, mm. uh, maiden name. And uh, and it opened their eyes to that, that I did have uh, the culture of the African-American folks mm. with me as well. So it gave me an audition. But it was the place that of honor. It was a, it was a place of prestige. So and it was where the finest work was being done. Uh, and recognized throughout the world by black American actors. So if, if I'm going to reach, let me reach the highest rung. So I reached for them. And then when I, once I got in, I uh, quickly earned my way and my keep and climbed to the top. Uh, within a year, I was, you know, lead, lead actor there. And uh, Douglas Turner Ward's influence on me uh, sticks with me forever because he was another one of my great influences, a great mentor, an incredible director. Uh, not an easy man to understand, but a, a, a great teacher in that respect. Uh, he pushed you. Uh, he told me two or three things about my acting that changed the way I did it uh, and made me a much better actor and director. Can you tell me those things? Vulnerability is the first thing. Mm-hmm. He came with them all. So finding the opportunity to, to, to process defeat or process temporary defeat and be willing to share it. Mm-hmm. That's one of the big things. It's a hard one. Yeah, particularly for a guy that that, that, that never learned pretty much how to cry. Yeah. Or and not I don't mean externally, but to sh- to show that the that, that he's hurt or there are open wounds. You know, because once Doug convinced me that it was you could be safe on stage in your most vulnerable positions, then I changed took another whole level out of acting. Mm-hmm. You know, so those things were important to me. But the Negro Ensemble Company, the relationships that I built there with, you know, people like Francis Foster, who's who was a mentor and a, a queen mother, as I put her, and and uh, Moses Gunn and uh, Adolf Caesar, uh, Graham Brown, uh, Arthur French. Uh, these people were huge influences on me, and and they the NEC was a big family, so they extended. Their arms to me, people like Charles Weldon, uh, they opened their arms to me and looked at me as their hope uh, to a certain degree, not just me exclusively, but the whole group of us that were coming up behind them. They expected us to carry on the tradition, you know, the the, the form of integrity and, and, and uh, the dignity of, of the work that they were doing. Around that time, you tell a story about getting a call from your manager that you got it was good news and bad news. You got yes, the that was soldiers' play. <laughs> soldiers' play. Can you just tell that story? Well, I was. Uh, I wanted to be in soldiers' play. I was the, sh- the play to be in. If you were a black man in 1982, 83, 81, you wanted to be in soldiers' play. Um, so I wanted to audition. I did audition. It took me a while to get in, maybe six months to even get an audition because I had to change my name or either add on to my name and uh, just to be seen. And uh, in December... I received a call from my manager. We had beepers and the beeper call your answer service and it said, call your manager. I called my manager. He said, good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is you were cast in Soldier's Play, which is my dream. I said, what's the bad news? He said, you're the understudy. 
I said, but who, who am I playing? I want to study whoever loans I'm playing something. He said, nothing. You understudying everybody. And I, and I had to think about it and I said, that's going to be very hard if I'm not on stage because all I want to do is act and be on stage and be a part of the group. He said, you're a part of the group, but you just won't be on stage unless it's an emergency. And I'm like, I, 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 I got to think about that. He said, well, how much money do you have? I had like two, three dollars in my pocket, not even five dollars. I know I didn't have five dollars. I was headed to Jersey. A friend of mine was cooking and I could sleep on her couch because I was sleeping on couches. And uh, she would cook and I can eat for a couple of days free. And uh, and he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I think I'm going to have to decline it because I'm going to be miserable. And I just have to go do a temp job or keep auditioning with Children's Theater or something. Um, he said, but this is pretty good money. It's like $350 per diem, $350 salary. And I was like, I don't think I could do it. He said, well, I'm going to tell him. I said, yeah, okay. He told him and, uh, and they came back and gave me a small role. <laughs> and I still understood everybody. Wow. And that's all you needed. You just wanted to be something in the play. I wanted to it be on stage. What it was, but so. I understand young men. Like people are turning me down now for, for the national tour of Jitney because they would have to cover and there's no guarantee they're going to get on stage. Mm -hmm. And they feel like I felt that that's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, once I find a person who needs that money, because I do pay very well uh, and would like to be in the room and learn from me, and these incredible actors who do August Wilson and this director, myself, who knows the work pretty well. They say, you know, I'm going to take this chance. I'm going to come home with tens of thousands of dollars and I'll learn this August Wilson from the best mm -hmm. actors and, and a very formidable director. Yeah, I'm going to take that shot. And then they might end up on stage. Somebody might get a TV series while we're gone and they're there. So I understand making that, a, having that be a hard decision. But also you got to think about career. Yeah. You know, you're finding your way into a family uh, uh, that you want to be in. I want to be in the August Wilson family. I want to be in the Negro Ensemble Company family. So it's, it's a tough decision. You know, I, I bet the right bet that time. I've made the wrong bet many times, but that was a, that was a good bet. Yeah. In a speech you, you made, you talk about how the no's in your life that you've gotten have played just as big of a part as the yeses, the failures add up to just as much as the successes looking back on your life. And I, I thought that that is so interesting. But the no's that you have said to things also play a huge thing. Like you, you saying no to that and getting a role. And you, you said no to she's got to have it, right? Yes. Because because it was it was nudity. Too much nudity. Too much yeah. nudity. And at that time you had young children and you, you didn't want that. You've also said no to Oprah wanting to do Black on the Blues like on TV. And knowing that your story being told in a compromised way on television like that, having to change the language. You know, so the no's, I, you know, people sometimes in different positions in life, like in these three stories of something is lost but something is gained because you you've kept your you've kept your integrity of of the work right yes you have to be very careful with those you can't toss them around like the gumdrops mm -hmm. they're, 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 it's for a reason you can't and you and you can't say no to it. what you got to see you, you say no what's your option for one and why why the no i'm always looking for an opportunity to get to the word yes that's what i wake up wanting to get to all the yeses i can that are that are that have integrity, that that get me, move me to another square forward, to take care of my family, to, to nurture my career. I want to say yes. Yeah. That's what I want to say. So I weigh it very carefully mm -hmm. if I'm going to say no to something. If I say yes to something, I have to look at what the results are going to be or what do I, I project the results are going to be. What are the negatives and the positives? Then I have to balance it. And if the negatives outweigh the positives, then I got to say no. So you dig what I'm saying? Because I don't want my kids. Film is forever. I go and film nude uh, with, with the possibility of frontal nude because there's no there's no clause saying it would only be your butt and mm -hmm. your chest. Mm -hmm. It says complete nudity. Mm -hmm. That means I've said anything you want to shoot on me, you can. Right. And film is forever. Yeah. Am I willing to do that? And that was no, I was not willing to do that. So or or when I said no to, to Oprah, uh, though I wanted with all intent to work with Oprah and I still do and I have worked with her 
their eyes are watching God. I work with yeah. her and other things. I work with her, but I've just worked with, on a television network for uh, uh, David Makes Man. So it's not about Oprah. It's about what is the best thing for 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 Lackawanna Blues. Am I going to be true to what I know? Or am I going to make a, a really good television movie and I'm just going to kind of skim over a lot of things? I want to go deep. So I'm going to say the language and the things that they said in HBO Loud that it wasn't a no to Oprah. It was no to the format. It was going to ABC. And I knew ABC was going to put the shackles on me in, 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 a, in, a, in a sense. And then when you say no, what is your option? I had options. Yeah. I had Showtime and HBO yeah. and... and, and uh, Sony a producer Sony wants to do it as a feature film. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, that same producer now is producing Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I just yeah. wrote. Yeah. Todd Black. Yeah. Wow. So so I had options. Yeah. You gotta be careful when you say no, what are you going to? Even you gotta go to something. Yeah. If I say no to an acting job, I gotta say yes to my waiter job, and that's fine. Yeah. Or my or my temp job, that's fine. Yeah. Or my writing uh, assignment that's fine you know but i can't say no and then go pull grass up in central park and eat it you know what i'm saying what are you doing you're saying no to what like i had a young actor who's in my workshop now and he said i just said no to a movie i wasn't feeling it i said well what weren't you feeling well i didn't like the way it was written I said, well, is, was it derogatory? No, I just think it could have been written better. Well, maybe maybe it will get written better. Maybe you can make the writing better. I don't know. But what are you doing then? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, they offered him to play Michael Cooper, the basketball player, in a Lakers movie. How bad can a Lakers movie be? Is it just like all going to be all orgies? Uh, <laughs> or is it going to be, what is it going to be? They're going to turn into the Harlem Globetrotters? I mean, I, I don't know. But I'm saying, how bad can Michael Cooper be? What? I just have never read anything to make Michael Cooper a villain, a demon. So what are you? I said, what are you going to? And he just sat there. Mm-hmm. I said, you you got a job? No, uh, my manager. I said, who's your manager? Well, I ain't met her yet, but we I signed a contract. I said, let's talk after class because you just said some very not smart things right now. So we talk after class because you dig in a deeper hole. You know what I'm saying? What are you saying no and going to? Mm-hmm. If you say no, you got to give yourself a yes. Do you like that? Yes. <laughs> but you're giving yourself a yes the moment you have to choose you first mm. before you expect anybody else to choose you. Mm. So I'm getting ready to go on auditions this afternoon. Mm-hmm. And I'll see in the actor's eyes when they walk in who believes they're the one. Mm-hmm. And then who's trying to make me choose them. Mm. Now, wait. Now, that's really interesting. As an actor... Do you think about that when you go into an audition? Yes. And how do you put that in your eyes? I know I'm the one. <laughs> you just know. Yeah, I've done the work. <laughs> I've done all the work necessary. I've read the role. I have all the requirements. I've honed the skills. I've fine-tuned it to the best of my singular mm. vi- ability. I'm extremely prepared. You know, mm. I come in believing I am that the, the actor for the role. You might not know it, mm. but I'm going to do everything in my power to show you what and who this character is clearly is and how that character could serve your play. Mm-hmm. I chose me going in. Mm-hmm. And 90% of the time, the person on the other desk is not going to choose me. On the other side of the desk is not going to choose me. And I still have to leave whole. Mm-hmm. I have to leave still a whole human being, mm-hmm. not defeated. And, and how do you leave not defeated? It, you, ju- you just leave everything there? No, the mm-hmm. victory was when I walked in to wait to what I gave you in that room. I did just what I set out to do. Mm-hmm. I did my best. I am fine with that. I don't have to be fine with you choosing me. Mm-hmm. I would like you to choose me. Yeah. That's my goal. That's why I came in that room. I want you to say, you're right. You are the one. Yeah. 90, maybe 80 percent of the time you, you, you're going to disagree with me. Yeah. That don't make you a bad person, but it don't make me a bad person because I let you see what the solution was. I came in to solve your problem. You looking for somebody to play Canewell and seven guitars? Well, you're going to have a lot of other things to worry about. This you ain't going to have to worry about because I'm going to show you exactly what this guy is. I'm going to take away one of your worries right now. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> and I have said that to a casting director one time. You know what? Particularly after they had me in a couple times. I mean, I said to Bob Fossey when I was auditioning for the deal, when he had me in for the third time, mm-hmm. 
I said, Mr. Fossey, I'm going to solve your problem right now. Let's just end this right now. I'm, and this is, you know, I, I, this role is mine. I do everything you need in this role. I'll be everything you need in this role and some. So you need to f- handle that, that other business you got and get this off your plate. And he just laughed and got up and hugged me. He said, man, I love you. You know, I didn't get the role. <laughs> you know, And there could have been a thousand reasons why, right? Well, that one of the reasons is I get to tell this great story. <laughs> So it's, it's a great piece for my book. But did, do, you, do, I feel, do I seem defeated by any, any? No, because you know what? I have this saying. I always tell my agent this when they give me bad news about something. Like I just auditioned for a TV series that I'm perfect for with Brian Cranston. Mm. Me and Brian Cranston? Mm-hmm. Come on. Yeah. They turned me down and went for an actor who I've taught in school. <laughs> and I said to myself, I said, you, 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 you know what? Um, uh, that's good for that actor. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever reason they felt that he would be the one, maybe I'm too much. Yeah. Maybe I would take too much. I like to look at it in a positive light. Say maybe I would draw too much attention. Yeah. Now, there's certain directors that hire me because they know where to cut. Harold Becker said to me when I did uh, uh, Domestic Disturbance, he came with me. So, you know why I hire you, Ruben Santiago Hudson? I said, why, Mr. Becker? He said, because when I don't know where to cut, I cut to you. You're always involved. You're always mentally active. You're always focused. If something dulls up, that's why I always shoot you even if you have no lines. (laughs) I put B camera on you. And then when I get to the editing room, when this looks dull, stale, cut to Ruben. That's that's such an amazing compliment. And if you want an example of it, look at Shaft. Watch how many times it cut to me in in, uh, uh, Devil's Advocate when I have no lines. Mm. Not that they don't cut to other actors when they don't yeah. have lines. It's storytelling. But watch how many times in Devil's Advocate they cut to me and I have nothing to say. Mm-hmm. That's storytelling. I mean, I'm telling stories. Tell, telling a story without talking. So, yeah. anyway, the no's create fortitude and perseverance. When people tell you no, if you really want this, then you have to, you got to buckle up. You got to, you got to buckle up and it, and, and, and it, it make you have to go further because now you got to go into the next room, which might be a no. So you just got to start building up your armor. Mm-hmm. And the best place to build up your armor for resistance of all the no's you're going to receive is by doing the work. And where do you do the work in the regional theater? So you, you build a host of yeses to combat all the no's you're going to get. Mm-hmm. So that's why I always recommend the kids go to the regional theaters and off Broadway and off off Broadway and learn how to accept yeses mm-hmm. and applause. Because they're going to take a host of no's and they need to be prepared for them. Mm-hmm. So that's why I say the no's are, are just in, in, important to me. Because it, 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 I say, oh, you're going to test me and tell me that, no, I'm not right for this role. Mm-hmm. You're testing me because I know I am. Okay, now watch me go into the next one. And you'll get like, you know, 40 no's. Mm-hmm. If you have 40 auditions there, they'll say no. Yeah. You know, whether it's when you, when you add up commercials and voiceovers. And, mm-hmm. and then it's like, then that one, all you need is one yes. Like I told, I'm, I'm teaching a young man now in my workshops and he's from uh, Barbados and he has a little bit of accent. So sometimes he drops the ending of words or he'll don't do all the syllables and sometimes he won't, won't do syllables. So I tell him, I need to hear the language and I'm on him so hard. So sometimes I stop and pull him to the side and say, I know I'm on you hard, but listen, all they need is one reason not to give you the job. Mm-hmm. Don't let that one reason be they can't understand you. Mm-hmm. We're going to fix that. They don't have to find another reason not to give you the job because you're too good of a damn actor. Mm. for them to have that one little thing that we can repair. Mm. Then he starts crying and hugs me. I said, we're going to fix that because mm. they're not going to have that excuse. They may say your nose is too big or your hair is too pretty or you're too skinny or too short. Let them come up with something else because yeah. I can't fix you being your height. I can't fix, you know, how pretty you are. Yeah. I can't fix, fix your nose. You know, I can fix that. I want to go back to the, you're running an audition today. What do you do to make sure that the actors coming in are going to give their best? I, I know it's it's on them to give their best, but but there is a certain thing that you, that's on you, I, I think, to establish a, 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 ten, a tension-free room, right? I mean, or, or something like that. Or, yes. So, but just... Can you just talk me through what you need to do? Like- I have to try to meet them halfway instead of impress me. Instead of me sitting behind the desk saying impress me, every actor that walks in the room, I'm up to them extending a handshake or, or an embrace. You know, these days you can't be hugging women. Yeah. 
You know, so if it's a guy, I give him a shoulder, mm -hmm. good handshake, thank him for coming. Mm -hmm. I thank her for coming, you know, and just ask him how they doing. You know, uh, I don't have a lot of small talk. I would just say how much I appreciate them being there. Mm -hmm. Take their time. And if they have any questions, you know, hit me with them. But in the meantime, this is their time. Mm -hmm. And then I give everybody more than one chance. Mm. I get up and talk to them quietly. Doesn't matter how, doesn't matter. They no matter how bad or how yeah. good they are. Yeah. If they're so good, I want to see, can they take my adjustment? I'll give them adjustment, not a random adjustment. I can fine tune a little bit and see if they take it. Yeah. And if they're that bad, I get up, make, give them a major adjustment. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. And we talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm giving the reader notes. I've had three readers of mine who eventually I cast in plays later. Tell me how important the reader is, because I just was a reader at auditions and I I was horrible. And I really thought, man, th like they really should have a great reader here. And I'm not that person like in it, I saw how important the reader is to the other actor. And and I was kind of directed to not be good. And so I, I I wasn't I wasn't taking it too. I don't know. I don't know why a director would tell you that. Your job is to help that actor get the role. Right. So you so be present. It's not your audition. That doesn't mean you don't give them something. Yeah. You still have to you have to connect in 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 you guys are working together. You're working together for that person to get this role. Yes. So what how can you be helpful? Are you helpful by not giving them anything? It's not your audition, but how can you be helpful to that person? Now, sometimes I have to back the reader down a little bit. Because they're because they're they're, yeah. they're too excited. Or That's acting. rare. Yeah. Most of the time I have to bring them up a little bit. Yeah. And say, pick up the pick up those cues. Right. Pick them up. Give me right. a little bit of fire in, 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 in the barrel. Give me a little bit more. Yeah. Because I really I really noticed that every time I was right on, they were they were great. Like it, it, it couldn't have been just because they were always great and that's why I was good. No, no I, was, I was giving them. I always a, demand a very good reader. Like I have a great reader coming in today, young young actor who's working all the time on TV and Broadway, yeah. but he wants to be in the room with me. Yeah. So he comes because I never gave him an audition. Mm. He just never fit anything I was doing, really, I felt. But so he told the casting director when the casting director said, I know this is a long shot, but would you come in and read for Ruben? And he said, oh, yeah, I want to be in a room with Ruben. So it's a good idea. He, today, he and I are going to bond. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know next time he's going to be in the room or just get an offer. Yeah. Uh, once I hear how, he, how this works today. But I always demand a good reader. Sometimes I'll let the reader go and let the casting director read because it's a good reading, casting director. Mm. Dave Cap reads great. Marsha DeBonis reads great. These are casting directors. Mm -hmm. They read very well. Mm -hmm. You know, so if it's not a good reader, I'm not happy. Yeah. I'll read. I've dismissed the actor, the reader, and I read. Mm. And, you, and you find that that's okay. You can you can get enough, ob be ob objective enough to see what the actor's doing. Even oh, yeah. You're reading. yeah. I'm taping it, too. Yeah, right, right. I'm taping it, too. Right. So I'm not trying to evaluate them when I'm reading. Yeah. I'm there. I'm trying to help them get the role. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the tape. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to blow them off the, the, the screen, and I'm not trying to get the role myself. I'm just trying to help them. Yeah. And then yeah. I know how to elicit if I, if I want to pop at them with something yeah. or I want to be more, more uh, sentimental or internal about something. I can lead them where I want to lead them. When did you first come in contact with the work of August Wilson? And what did it mean to you early on? Ma Rainey, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Court Theater, 1984. I snuck in intermission, jumped up there to the double mezzanine and sat up there on the stairs and the lights came on and these actors started. I looked down on the stage and saw everybody I knew. All the people that had taught me from how to shine shoes or to shoot pool or, 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 or the guys that went in the liquor store and, and got a pint of wild Irish rolls for me when I was too young to get it. Uh, guys that Taught me how to shoot, how to fish, you know, guys that taught me what it meant to, 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 to be a man, how to skin a catfish. All those guys were sitting on stage. Mm -hmm. So I was so at home and it was so sentimental to me that I just started crying. Mm -hmm. So I never knew that you could put the people that were my idols in a way 
on stage. So I said, whoever wrote this, it, 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 I got to find him. And that's when I first was introduced to August. And I chased him. I just wrote him letters, he and Lloyd. I always knew about Lloyd because Lloyd went to the same university I went to in Detroit, Wayne State. Mm. So I was always chasing Lloyd, but I had both of them together now. Mm. And so I chased them until I finally got them. And, and by that, you mean they finally put you in? I, I was just wanting to get in the room and audition because I knew if they saw me, they knew I had something. Mm -hmm. Whether I was right for it or not, I would I would be impressed them enough. I would, my prayer was to impress them enough that they would keep me in mind. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was it was two trains running in 1993 uh two or something like that or uh, maybe four i don't know 1993 or something i uh, went in finally for the for two trains running and uh and they remembered me so when uh seven guitars became available they called me back in mm -hmm. and the rest is history you then directed seven guitars is that the first play you directed yes no, no. my first one was gem of the ocean oh, okay not too long before that, though. Yeah, not too long before that. No. So Seven Guitars, Lance Reddick, lead role. Yep. And th this is Charlie what... Weldon, Kevin Carroll, yeah. Rosalind Ruff, Stephen McKinley Henderson. Here's a quote from Lance Reddick. Ruben is a genius, a freaking genius, and he's a hard ass. He's got an enormous ego. He can be kind of a bully. He's got a mean streak, and every time I see him, it's like family. He drove me nuts. There was times when I hated him, and I adore the guy. <laughs> I have so much admiration for him and his commitment to the work and how good he is. And Harry Lennox was on my show, and he's, when I mentioned you, I forget why, he said, that guy's crazy. <laughs> but he had a smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> and then so then I heard then I hear, hear this from Lance Reddick that's why I really needed to talk to you I'm like what is it that you're that you were doing to these guys that was both driving them crazy and making them love you <laughs> at the same time and having this this thing where he he he, he thinks you're like family now yeah your yeah. Lance is very you know you know it's the standard. It's the standard of excellence that I, that I, that I'm that why they say I'm crazy. It's the standard of excellence that I know that's in both of those guys that they were trying to fake me about. And you can't fake me. You got to give it up or not give it up. And Lance had always been in the comfort zone of his work and been accepted, you know, by masses for for his work, which which he was delving out in limitations. And I wouldn't accept that. Mm. You know, and he, he, you know, I ran him crazy because I needed something from him that he was afraid to go and do, you know, bring me a real feeling about something that was very precious to him and sacred to him. And he didn't want to go there because it would, it would make him have to reveal something in front of a group of strangers that he did not want them to know about him. He didn't want that. He didn't want you to see his, what did I tell you Doug told me? Vulnerability. Yeah. The open wounds that you're willing to like show, you really take the bandaid off and say, you see this, see this thing that's open and it's hurting. And if you touch it or breathe on it hard, I'm going to scream and holler, but I'm going to let you see it and get close enough that you can breathe on it or touch it and make me holler. And I believe you won't do that to me. So I'm going to show you this open wound and I'm going to trust that you won't harm it. Yeah. People don't want to do that yeah. because that little touch of harm lasts forever. And he didn't want to go there. And I said, if you do not go there, we don't have a play. We are not going to win. I brought you in here for the victory. My ass, give me the victory. He went there once and could not get back home. He started crying and couldn't stop. And he was afraid to go back there again. And I kept standing in his dressing room and saying, you know what that felt like. It's okay. It's okay. So he would intermittently go there and not sometimes just, I, I don't, it ain't in me right now to go, go that deep. I don't want to go that deep. I don't accept that. Every day you're on that stage, you've got to leave a piece of yourself there. You must make the sacrifice. You must leave that precious part of yourself there because you got to pull that out of you to help form this incredible idol, this 
you're building an idol, something for people to look at and revere. And you cannot build it without substance. And the substance is inside of you if you follow where I'm coming from. So you got to give this precious thing up because you got to contribute it to the idol. When I say the idol, it's 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 what you're going to sacrifice. The idols are what people tear down and pull down and burn up and bury and steal. So that's what you building something that's very sacred. You cannot build something sacred without sacred material. So you need to bring me your heart. That's as sacred as you can get. If you don't bring me your heart, I'm going to keep on messing with you. Harry, completely different. Harry is about Harry. Mm. So I'm crazy because I won't accept it to be about you. Mm -hmm. Because the best you can give is your all. And once you defer to someone else, make the investment and make it about them, the more you shine. The best actor on stage is the most generous. So when I taught Harry to trust that, or when I uh, convinced him to trust that, it changed his performance. Amazing actor, got all the tools, got all the, can hit all the marks, mm. but can, but, but, you know, when Harry's not in control, it's a hard time for Harry mm. as an, as, as the actor or centerpiece of the play. He's best when he is in control of the moment. Mm. When he has to give that to the next person is where is, is, is harder work for him. Mm. I want you to be in control. I want it to be about you. And Harry got that clearly because he's such a smart actor, you know, and no one has challenged him that way. But the thing that about, you know, when actors work with me as a director, a lot of times in the back of their mind, they remember me as an actor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it intimidates them because mm -hmm. everything I've asked you to do, I can do it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, 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 and when I go to them, when I demand or that sort of thing from them, I say, just tell me what you need. I'm going to get it there. If you just want me and you to be in the room or just y'all two to be in the room or you want to process it or you want to, you know, one actor just told me, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. This is just my process. You know, just let me work my way. And I say, oh, absolutely. I back up. Mm. But after another week and I don't see no progress, I remind them. I'm hanging with you. I'm patient with you now. You're getting close. And they got to go there. Mm. I had one actress go there one time. And uh, she quit acting. She said, I can't give that much of myself up again. That's a healthy, that's a healthy person, I think, right? Well, she also met a, met a rich guy and <laughs> got engaged. <laughs> so but really she was up. like, you know, she said that was the part that changed, made her a completely different human being mm. to access that part of herself that she had buried wow. and protected and cloaked. But she took the wrapping off of it and she was saying, wow. I had suppressed the idea that I could share that. This is an incredible art. I mean, it, isn't it? I mean, like what you're talking about here, it's just unlike anything else. So it brings up another quote from you. I hear actors all the time saying, it's not brain surgery. You know, I'm not a doctor. It's not science. No, you're you're a doctor, baby. Because doctors and brain surgeons are coming to see you up on the stage, and that's their medicine. Yeah. And when I heard you say that, I was like, there's so many actors that have come on this show and said, you know, first thing I want to say is like, I don't take this that seriously, you know. I, I don't want to talk about this that much. I don't, I don't want to sound like I take this too seriously. And from that quote, it sounds like you're saying you have to take this seriously. Yeah, but but Peter, people come in from different perspectives. I don't have opportunities to squander. I'm a black Puerto Rican in America. And everything you know about me was taught to you by somebody who don't know me. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a chance to teach you about me personally, undiluted, pure. I don't have opportunities to squander. This is a very urgent, vital time. And you have put a microphone in my mouth. You have given me a platform to share honestly how I feel. Am I going to sit up here and BS? I don't have that opportunity. I can fix something right now. 
Somebody, some, one person hears this and it makes them see the importance of what we do and that they can actually fix something. That somebody got a bigger microphone than me right now called the President of the United States is damaging and destroying and distorting things. He got a bigger microphone than me. I got this little microphone you give me on a podcast and somebody's going to listen. And if I could fix something, I'm going to fix it. So when I do a play, and, and not in not in a, 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 a not in a, a unrealistic sense, in a realistic sense, I'm going to show you truly the potential of this individual, how much I can actually be, how whole I am, how human I am. Listen, if I do a play, and I'm on Broadway, off Broadway, or in the cafeteria downstairs, whoever came to witness it saw a whole different, got a whole different idea about who I am and people that look like me when they leave. Mm -hmm. I ain't gonna correct everything by doing no damn play, hell no. But all of a sudden you see that you don't have to lock your door when you see me. Or when I say good morning to you, if you a young lady, it ain't like I gotta say, baby, hey, baby, hey, baby, hey, baby, you know, where you going with all that butter, stuff like that. No, that I am a man that said good morning and did not even look back at you that nodded to you with a smile. I'm a human being. I'm a man who loves his kids and his wife, who supports his community, who votes and pays taxes, who's a mentor, a teacher, a son, a father, and a brother. Who will take the shirt off his back, buy you a pair of shoes, not give you a dollar for a sandwich, but give you a sandwich? I'm not who you thought. Whoever told that lie on me wasn't me. So let me tell the truth about me. So yes, I take it very serious because the only place I matter in this world other than in my house is when I'm on stage or on TV and on film. Other than that, I hate to put them just another N word on the street. When I walk in the elevator, women clutch their purses until the other person on the side of the elevator says, oh my God, I love June Billions. Then the person who's clutching their purse loosen it up a little bit because now I mattered because mm -hmm. somebody qualified uh, 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 you know, somebody qualified me. Somebody gave me a stamp of validation. But immediately somebody else told a lie on me because you wouldn't have clutched your purse. You know, so I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix what I can fix. You know, when you see me, I mean, the twinkle in my eye, it's like, you know, I mean, people, like I was telling uh, one of my mentees the other day, I said, you know, I don't know what it is but I wake up in the morning happy to be alive, happy to be in me, happy to know that I can change something through my art. I like that. It, that challenge is amazing to me. I get up and, and I walk down the street and I have this little smile on my face sometimes. People think I'm crazy. Or I can be serious because I'm contemplating something. But people walk up to me sometime, and this happened many times. Particularly, it happened to me in Columbus, Georgia. It happened to me in Atlanta. It happened to me in Buffalo. It happened to me here in New York. Where well, somebody would say to me, a person of another color, a white person, why do you walk that way? I'm like, what? how am I walking? Mm -hmm. How am I walking? Like I belong? Mm -hmm. I should not walk like I belong? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. I had a dude in Chicago say to me, you walk like you own the sidewalk. I'm way on the side but aside, while coming from church, headed to the Goodman Theater to a matinee, and two white, white guys are walking toward me. I have on this how long ago was that on my Walkman. I was doing seven guitars. And they said something to me, and I thought they were asking directions. I took off my headphones, excuse me. They said, you walk like you own the sidewalk. And I looked at all that sidewalk of Michigan Avenue to my left, because to the right was nothing but the streets and the tree. And I'm like, all that sidewalk to the left? And I act like I own... And I just stopped for a second. I said, you know what? This little piece that I'm on, that's as wide as my shoulders and my feet. Yeah, that's mine. Mm -hmm. But what provoked them to ask me why I walk the way I walk? Mm -hmm. Something they saw that said, I, I believe I belong. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So do I let that harm the rest of my day? No, but that story sticks with me to this day because it's happened to me more than one time. Had a guy lean out of truck, Columbus, Georgia. You walk, why you walk like that? You got to walk like you're special. I'm like, yeah, I am. I am special. How you doing? You special too. God bless you. You know, and be like, what's up with that? So that's trying to 
put me in a particular place. On stage, ain't no particular place for me. Ain't nowhere I can run, ain't nowhere I can hide. The lights come on, you, you strangers come to this dark room and breathe the same air, lights come on and I'm there. And you can't run and hide. You could leave it in a mission if you want. Mm -hmm. But you can't run and hide because I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you something that I think is the most important thing you're gonna hear that day and I'm gonna share it through a whole human being who I hope at the end of the day you would like to have a cappuccino with or, or maybe a cold beer. I said, I want, I want to talk to this guy. And that was one of the biggest compliments somebody said to me one time. They said, you know, every time I see you on stage, I just want to have a beer with you. I just want to sit with you. I want to talk to you, man. I want to know you. That means he saw something that they recognized, something that made them curious and comfortable in the same time. Yeah, anyway. Will you please come back on the show? Yeah, yeah. Ruben Santiago Hudson, thank you so much. That's You're welcome. Really appreciate it. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.